we have a number of people still streaming in, but since we're past 3.30 and we're gonna go ahead and get started, welcome everybody to the Soil, Water and Climate uh, Department Seminar. Today we will have uh, John Bellata and Carrie Jennings speaking together. Um, before I introduce them, I just wanna say that uh, we have one more seminar of the semester and that's a week from today, and that'll be Nick Jelinski and Melvin Giles. Uh, and they'll be talking about sustainable community university partnerships. But today I have the honor of introducing Carrie and John. Uh, John is a research project specialist with the University of Minnesota's Water Resources Center, where he leads the Minnesota Stormwater Research and Technology Transfer Program, including leading the Minnesota Stormwater Research Council. And Carrie is a research and policy director at the Freshwater Society, 22 of those with the Minnesota Geo Geological Survey and two with the DNR Division of Lands and Minerals. And today they'll be speaking about uh, banking groundwater, assessing aquifer storage and recovery in Minnesota. So welcome John and Carrie. Well, thank you, Kelly. And thank you, everyone. I assume you can hear me just fine. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. Can, yep. um, I'm going to take the first part of the presentation and then Carrie will be taking the second half. I want to introduce you to uh, a very large interdisciplinary project that we've been working on that will come to conclusion here in the next couple of months. Um, the title of it is Banking Groundwater Through Aquifer Storage and Recovery. But perhaps before uh, I talk to you about what ASR is, as we abbreviated, is a pause for us to think about groundwater in the state of Minnesota and, and reflect on the fact that for the vast majority of Minnesotans, more than 75% of us rely on groundwater as our primary drinking water source, as do many of our industries and our agricultural production across the state. So groundwater is extremely important to us. And um, one of the questions we find ourselves asking is if that groundwater beneath our feet is sustainable. And one of the things we look at is uh, the sustainability and the behavior of aquifer recharge across the state. And uh, our project is looking at one of the ways that uh, aquifer recharge could happen in the future. So uh, let's see if I get my slides to go forward here. So the first thing I do, uh, I do want to call out to uh, give my uh, kudos to uh, Carrie and the entire team at the Freshwater Society. The Freshwater Society has really uh, led the way in us looking at groundwater issues and challenges across the state. And uh, our work that we're going to present today on banking groundwater will complete uh, a series of now four reports that Freshwater Society has led tackling and addressing this critical issue that we all rely on. So thank you uh, for providing that leadership. So what is our motivation behind looking at groundwater? I mentioned about our need for it as humans, but, but also our industries across the state. And, and we reflect about not only how we use water, but who else do we share this water with across industries, people, and communities. And certainly that is a challenging uh, aspect for us to keep in mind. One of the questions we've thought about is, will there be enough groundwater for you and I and for our industries across the state in the future? And uh, we've done enough research and enough monitoring to be able to ask that question that that sustainability or that use is in jeopardy for the future. So what you're seeing here uh, on the screen right now is uh, an image of the Twin Cities metropolitan area. And what's represented here is looking at the Prairie Duchesne Jordan Aquifer. This is an aquifer that the vast majority of the Twin Cities region relies on for its groundwater source. Now, it's important to remember that not everyone in the Twin Cities region relies on groundwater, but many of our suburbs, our communities, and certainly the agricultural sectors in this area do rely on the Prairie Duchesne uh, as its uh, primary source. And what our modeling and monitoring suggest here is what's illustrated here is that for parts of uh, our region, we will see uh, an increased pressure and thereby um, a drawdown in the aquifer levels. 
that could make our availability and sustainability in the future highly questionable. And that's just the Twin Cities. We can explode this up and take a look at the whole state. Um, and we have a large system of monitoring wells uh, throughout the state of Minnesota. And as we look at these wells, they also uh, give to us a glimpse of how uh, water uh, levels are doing in our aquifers across the state. So we could focus in on just one of these, for example. Uh, this is a graph representing uh, aquifer levels near the city of Benson in west central Minnesota. And what our monitoring has shown us is that since the mid 1990s, we have seen a steady decline in the head of this aquifer in, in the amounts of about 15 feet. So um, this, this trend is, is not sustainable. And certainly in terms of our use, we need to be paying attention to this. Well, lucky for us in Minnesota, not only we look at water levels, but we can take a peer deeper into the data and we can look at how our water is being used. And so at this particular well, again, back in Benson, we can actually look at uh, where this water is being used. There's a lot of information on this chart. I will just uh, bring your attention to the light blue line at the top. This is uh, water use total, million, uh, millions of gallons per year. And we can see some variation here, but the trend is of course upwards for more and more use of this particular uh, well in this region. We can dissect that further by use of that water. Um, and you can see the city of Benson, municipal use, golf courses, irrigation, and other sources. But in this particular region, what we see is uh, changes in agricultural irrigation uh, on the increase. And so this is just an example of the information that we can pull from our monitoring network across the state that can give us an, an idea of how water is being used, its trends, and what we're seeing in, in aquifers, which is uh, in many cases a decline. Now, it's not only having to do with the use of the water in those aquifers, but also in terms of recharge, we can look at things like climate change. And climate change will impact the ability of our aquifers to recharge in the future. We know because of climate change, precipitation patterns are changing, not only across the country, but certainly across Minnesota. And where the water falls and when it falls, will impact how our aquifers are able to recharge in the future. So climate change impacts aquifer recharge in that way. Also, we're seeing increases in temperature. Increases in temperature will change things, for example, uh, evapotranspiration of crops, which could bring about more water use for irrigation. So climate change certainly has an impact in terms of aquifer recharge and use. We also know that the use of groundwater is changing across the state. What is represented on the image on the right is a well permits across the state. We are seeing increased number of well permits as well as increased number of these wells being used for irrigation purposes. These all give us a glimpse of how water is being used in terms of our aquifers. Now, I uh, don't want to paint all doom and gloom here. We know our aquifers are being used and there is some decline in there. Um, we do have the wherewithal in terms of obvious first steps for groundwater sustainability. Um, first of those is we can encourage conservation. There's a reason why we've heard since 1970, uh, turn off the tap when we brush our teeth. Uh, we have the ability and the knowledge to know how we can conserve water. This is especially important with cities uh, where we are drawing municipal um, sources out of the groundwater. So if we can empower cities, give them more information to encourage conservation, that should be our first tool in the toolbox. Another tool we have is to encourage water reuse. Uh, this is not an old, uh, uh, new concept. It's been used for decades, but it is certainly on the increase in the state of Minnesota. Uh, on a stormwater aspect, we are installing and using more stormwater reuse systems uh, every year. However, stormwater reuse systems in Minnesota do encounter some barriers. And so one of the things that we can do to encourage water reuse, thereby decreasing our uh, reliance on aquifers, 
is to coordinate our roles across agencies and eliminate some of the barriers we have to water reuse. A third step that we can take in terms of groundwater sustainability is to recognize that in some areas, aquifer recharge is going to meet, need to be prioritized and that um, aquifer recharge is going to be required. There are two uh, major approaches to aquifer recharge, passive and active. And, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about the differences of those in a moment. Our work is studying the active recharge component. The motivation behind this is that if we can um, sustainably uh, manage our aquifer resources and recharge our aquifers through things like aquifer storage and recovery, we can create more reliable seasonal, wa seasonal water sources. We can meet peak demands without building larger treatment plants or digging more wells or deeper wells. We can make water reserves less vulnerable to contamination, especially those on the surface. Uh, storing water on the surface takes up a lot of land, and so we can conserve our land area by storing water underground. And we also need to remember that sustaining groundwater isn't just for ourselves, it's a support of the entire ecosystem around us. It feeds our trout streams, our lakes, our wetlands, and our all important fens. So this system of managed aquifer recharge could be a tool for us for sustaining uh, aquifers for the future. And as I mentioned, there's two approaches, passive and, uh, passes, uh, passive and active. The passive approach uses large infiltration basins pictured here um, that allow the water to slowly infiltrate back into the ground, reading, uh, reaching those superficial aquifers and perhaps even infiltrating into deeper aquifer levels, uh, lower in the soil uh, profile. That's one. A second approach is what we call active. Um, and this is a system that we've been studying through our project, aquifer storage and recovery. And in short, ASR uses uh, high capacity pumps to pump water back into the ground, into aquifer, to store it and then to recover it later on when we're in most need of it. This is a very active approach. So with that said, uh, I do want to introduce you uh, a very large interdisciplinary team that we put together to look at ASR and whether or not it can help us tackle some of our groundwater sustainability issues for the state of Minnesota. So as you can see, we have a large team. I won't uh, run through all these names. Uh, the team is led uh, by Carrie, and she'll talk in a few minutes. And we put together a, a large interdisciplinary team across multiple university partners, also uh, collaborating with the Freshwater Society. And we've even brought on uh, a couple of economic uh, specialists from the Center for Agriculture and Rural Development down at Iowa State. And so these great minds have come together for us to dissolve this project into uh, looking at a few different things with ASR. What we are, have attempted to do is to examine the demographic climate and water trends across the state, then look at where uh, aquifer storage and recovery could be appropriate given geology and source water uh, possibilities. And, and more specifically, uh, looking at the engineering, economic, and the policy considerations that need to be taken into account if we were to look at ASR in the state. All of this work is coming to a uh, conclusion here in the next two months that's going to result in a report that we present to the Minnesota legislature for the 2021 session. Another way of looking at managed aquifer recharge and the approach our team has taken is to look at all the little bubbles around uh, aquifer recharge. There's a lot of different aspects that we have needed to take into account. Uh, for example, starting at the top, it's not just the hydrologic assessments, but it's how they relate to geology. 
and then taking in account environmental risk, economic uh, cost and benefits, and engineering methods. Now, those are all very technical in aspect, and we need to take all of those in account in terms of looking at um, uh, aquifer storage and recovery. But there is also the human side, the social acceptance side, which is why our project has also prioritized stakeholder engagement to look at how this could work across agencies, expertise, and communities. So all of these aspects are a part of our um, study looking at ASR. Well, if you're like me, I grew up in the state of Minnesota. When, when uh, Carrie and I started talking about aquifer storage uh, and, and recovery, I was thinking to myself, we wanna take high horsepower pumps and pump millions of gallons of water underground. And I just asked myself, wow, that seems un unfathomable. And wait a second, you wanna come back in a couple months later and pull millions of gallons of water back out? This whole idea seemed um, uh, impossible in a way, but actually it has been happening across the world uh, for decades. And what our literature was able to reveal is we have a whole database of uh, managed aquifer recharge systems across the globe that we've been able to access. So in part, uh, part of our project is looking at these uh, sites across the world, more specifically in the United States. And we've actually assembled a number of case studies that we're gonna present that can provide lessons learned for Minnesota if we were to pursue ASR systems in the future. So let me talk a little bit more about the aspects of our project. There are five specific elements each one of these has a sub research team and actually report all of it of itself. First, we uh, identified areas and aquifers to study. And you can see on the image of Minnesota here on the right side of the screen, uh, we ended up selecting four areas to study. Uh, Carrie's gonna talk a little bit more about these four areas momentarily. With these areas in mind, we then characterize the aquifers and then ultimately looking at what is the injection capacity for these aquifers to inject uh, water into them and then recover that water. Some of that involves then number three, evaluating the environmental and engineering barriers that would exist in these locales and evaluating the economics, the cost and benefit of doing so and the policy barriers that we might uh, uh, run into if we were to to um, work with one of these systems. And all of this has to be taken in account with stakeholder engagement across uh, Minnesota. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the policy and economic aspects, uh, the sub team that I particularly worked on with this project very briefly. Um, we have uh, both an opportunity and a challenge in Minnesota in regards that we have this approach of distributed water governance. Now, if we think about aquifer storage and recovery, um, we have one aspect of this, of that project that would pump clean water into the ground. So now you're talking about uh, water quality and groundwater and in the in state governments, that would be something that would be governed by uh, Minnesota Department of Health. But in a couple months, if we want to withdraw millions of gallons from that well, that's a quantity issue. And that is actually governed by the DNR and so on. So this distributed water governance, when we're talking about ASR, means that we need to work with multiple regulatory agencies across the state. So uh, in part, what our project did is starting to look at which Minnesota regulations uh, are relevant to aquifer storage and recovery. For example, Minnesota well codes. And so there's a lot of information and in, in there's a lot of um, different regulations that would have to be addressed for any individual ASR system as we think about these pilot areas or other areas across the state. And if that wasn't enough, um, in an injection well uh, through uh, an aquifer, aquifer storage and recovery system is actually governed by the Environmental Protection Agency. It's actually a type five injection well governed by the Safe Drinking Water Act. 
And because Minnesota does not, uh, is not a primacy state for this EPA regulation, we would also have to involve the EPA in any attempt to do ASR in the state. Now, there are other states that have assumed uh, what we call primacy over class five injection wells. So that could be an avenue that Minnesota would pursue in the future. So as you can see, there are multiple layers of policy that we would need to address in terms of ASR as a system in the state of Minnesota. Economics is a whole nother factor. Um, in Minnesota, we have a lot of water and water is often uh, referred to as, a, as an inexpensive asset. But the cost of doing ASR is high. There are high capacity pumps and hardware that need to be installed. And so looking at the cost and benefit of aquifer storage and recovery is critical for us in assessing where this might be applicable across the state of Minnesota. So what our study is doing is looking at which types of cost benefit analysis could help us better evaluate uh, where ASR could provide benefit. And so one of the things that we've discovered in our study is where we might need to go in the future is constructing a decision support system for ASR in the state. And, and what uh, our literature and our work has revealed is uh, in other places around the, uh, the country and across the world, they have such decision support systems that help guide them through this decision-making process. And so as, as we look at ASR and the multiple aspects uh, for the future, this will be one recommendation we may make. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Carrie at this point to talk more specifically about our project study areas and how we are characterizing these aquifers for potential ASR in the future. Carrie. Thank you, John. Let me just get my screen up and let me know if you can see that. Whoops, let me go full screen. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. We can't see your screen yet. Okay, I'm far away from you. So when it comes up, let me know and I'll get started. What are you seeing? Just your video right now. Okay. This doesn't bode well for quick slide transitions. I suppose we could take questions on John's portion at this point. He might have to leave us. Should I try to, that screen share again? Sure. Yeah, why don't you go ahead, Carrie, and then if there are any questions in the meantime, folks can feel free to unmute and ask John. Oh, oh there I, think is, but... I think you're coming up, Carrie. Yep. Okay, I, I think I did it wrong. Okay. Okay, we got it. So let me go on. So I'm going to be talking more specifically about the geology of the aquifers that we chose to study. We chose them for the range of characteristics that they show, and then the environmental and engineering barriers. Um, it gets complicated fast, but I want to try to simplify this. The, the injection capacity really has to do with how quickly you can pump water into the ground um, without it rising to the surface too quickly. Um, these are and, and you have to consider how much space is available in the aquifer to start with. So that's the hydraulic head in the aquifer. And if you have done groundwater modeling, you probably know the PICE solution. Um, basically, the well is on the left-hand side. You're pumping water into the ground. It goes in and rises to a certain level. It gets messy fast, but I can summarize it and just say that for a confined aquifer, you don't want to break the confining layer. And for an unconfined aquifer, you don't want to flood the surface. So we can just simplify these scenarios, take the math away and say that the confined situation where the, the beige layer represents a bedrock layer that is keeping the surface protecting the groundwater, you don't want to fracture that surface. And then in the other case, you don't want to like have aerial flooding, groundwater flooding at the surface. Those are our two limiting factors for how much water we can ultimately get in there. But you do have to start thinking about the characteristics of how quickly the aquifer accepts the water. Um, 
I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The, the variables that are important in this methodology really are just elevation of the, the ground, the density and the thickness of the confining layer, your initial groundwater level, um, what the saturated thickness currently is, those, those kind of factors. These were modeled by Dr. Peter Kung and his team in, for all of our four study areas. Um, we chose the Woodbury area because of the interesting um, problems with contamination at that site, but also because they're projected to have one of these areas of significant head decline. The geology there is layer cake, if you're looking at the bottom layers of the bedrock, um, which are represented by the yellow and green. If you look at the what's happened since the bedrock has been deposited, the glaciers have kind of carved a deep valley through parts of that bedrock. So that does kind of change the way water is going to flow in the bedrock layers. Um, we're looking at injecting, in this case, into the Jordan sandstone, which is hydrologically connected to the Prairie de Chien. So they're usually considered together. So we want to know how much space is in that aquifer, how much water we can actually fill up in the tank down there. And this is how much you can put in if you're at 85% capacity um, within the range of fracturing. 100% would be right up to that confining layer. So you're allowing a margin of safety here. So you can see that there's quite a bit of space. This is actually in meters. So in, in those dark red areas, there's greater than 80 meters of allowable storage in these aquifers. Um, it's higher in certain areas it varies with you know that bedrock topography. Um, the next thing you have to consider is how quickly that aquifer will accept the water. So if you're you know reversing the flow on a well and pumping down into that bedrock layer, the it depends on how connected the pores are in the bedrock. That's the hydraulic conductivity and then how thick that aquifer layer is. So you're just multiplying those two factors to get this basic transmissivity of that unit. Fortunately, we have test data that consultants will sometimes put in a report with the PCA that shows how quickly water can be pumped out of an aquifer. And you can use those data sets to estimate the transmissivity. Longer pumping tests are better than, better than short duration pumping tests. It just depends on how far away from the well you're actually measuring. So the longer duration of a test, the farther away from the well you're actually quantifying. Um, so those tests are used then to interpolate the transmissivity. You can do this in a variety of ways. They did Krieging to kind of smooth the, the transmissivity and hydraulic con conductivity over the area. Again, I'm gonna go kind of fast. This co bright colors tell you the answers in, in a very clear format if you're not red blind, color blind, red, red green. So um, you can then look at the, I'm sorry, transmissivity thickness. The other thing you might consider are um, how much head decline there is, that's storativity from a given pumping duration, what the radius of the well is, that does have an, a factor they used an average well radius, and then how long you're actually doing this, this pumping. So what they found was that the injection capacity in the Prairie de Chien Jordan Aquifer in the Woodbury area was adequate. It actually is in the higher range for some of the, the places where ASR is actually deployed around the world. Um, this would be a useful tool there. Um, there are some con concerns that you could, the water level could rise a little bit above the ground surface, maybe above the fracture capacity, right near the well injection point. So you could protect against that by um, having some barrier or just slowing down the rate of injection. The other concerns are that you want this bubble of groundwater to kind of stay within a certain radius. So you don't want it to just become very diffuse underground and hard to recapture, at least if that's your goal, if your goal is to recover it. And we, that was the scenario we were modeling. Um, so you want to know how large that bubble gets. So if you wanted to just run some numbers and look at Woodbury's population and how much water they use, they have you know about 73,000 people. They use a lot of water per day. We could probably cut that down. <laughs> 119 gallons a day seems, I'm sorry, yeah, a, a quarter of a cubic meter or 119 gallons a day. That's a lot of water, um, but that is the current estimate of what's being used. So if we needed to inject to accommodate that use, 
then we could inject for 11 days and serve the population for three months with nine injection wells. Usually you're not going to inject for as short a duration as 11 days. In fact, the injection period is usually considered to be the winter months when um, water use is lower, but it does depend on your source. So our results for three of the four study areas were similar to this. Um, we, you can see the map, same color scenario for Olmsted County and the Buffalo Aquifer, which is a confined, partially confined glacial sand body that's bounded by um, clays at the surface out by Moorhead. Um, it has very high transmissivities and you can inject there. Um, the concern there would be uh, flooding of the surface where it's unconfined. So this is a GIS tool now that Peter Kong has developed that can be applied other places. You still have to provide the background data, which is the um, pumping data. So, you know, we conclude that this is a simple and efficient method to estimate injection capacity of wells, and we successfully applied it to those three sites. Um, what would be better is if we had longer duration pumping tests and more continuous um, hydraulic head measurements of the, these aquifers, and if the state database were actually, um, if there were a state database, this was um, hard information to pull together. I'm just going to go ahead here because I want to get into the other issues, which is this is the part that was covered by Bill Arnold and his student Josh Kirk. And I'm going to put a clock in front of me so I don't run out of time here. Um, so we've covered the necessary ingredients. You have to really understand the aquifer characteristics, whether it's unconsolidated or consolidated, unconfined or confined. But then you have to find a suitable water source to inject into the aquifer. And you'll see that you'll, you may have noticed that I only talked about three of the sites being suitable or ASR, and that's because of a water source. Um, and then you have to figure out a way to get that water into the aquifer. Um, we mentioned the passive aquifer recharge at the beginning, but we're doing this direct injection method. This has actually been studied um, and it's being deployed in one place in Minnesota. This is one of the cases of the Shakopee, Mdewakot and Sioux community studied it to the point of injection, but then decided not to do it. But they currently have three production wells in the Jordan Aquifer and one that's deeper, pumping quite a bit of water to support all the um, activities at the casino and the associated hotels and event centers. Um, they do some treating for iron and manganese with reverse osmosis, and then they have a conventional wastewater treatment plant that treats 145 million gallons a year. They discharge that to surface water, so they are um, passively infiltrating um, the, with their discharge, and they can treat a lot more than what they're currently treating. So they could potentially recover 900 million gallons a year of water. And they considered injecting because they do see a growing population there with increased pumping. And currently, the way their effluent is handled, it's lost to the environment downstream of where they are. And this shows the flow path of the places where they use their treated wastewater for irrigation of their golf courses. So they are use they do deploy some reuse methods there, but it flows north to the Minnesota River Valley. And this region, um, which is in Scott County down here, is showing um, drawdown in these future scenarios modeled by Met Council. So they actually um, went so far as to do a lab bench top study of what kind of treatment would be required. They tested the water of the wastewater treatment plant to see what was still in it. And you can see here's the um, contaminants. Uh, many of these are not removed in conventional wastewater treatment. Um, the most common one we see is DEET across the state, but there are a lot of other things which represent pharmaceuticals and personal care products that people in the hotels and the community must be using. I remember when um, Ole Olmanson gave this talk, or a talk about this originally, he talked about the ingredients, camphor and menthol and one other thing he kept seeing um, and he found those three things in Ben Gay. So he figured that was somehow representative of who was at the casino. Um, but anyway, they took this treated wastewater and then they ran it through a scenario. They ran it physically through other treatment methods to remove these contaminants as part of their pilot study. Um, 
they ultimately decided not to go ahead. I think this got out of order. They ultimately decided not to go ahead with the project. Um, they did find that the chemistry of their injection water and the native water was compatible, um, but they did not have a suitable geology for this injection to occur. And I think there must be a slide hidden here. But in general, we, we um, provided quite a few case studies. This one was the closest to home, um, but Josh Kirk and Eileen Kirby both accumulated quite, and the Iowa team accumulated a lot of examples very close to home of where this is being done. And the overall lessons were that you have to carefully consider the chemistry of your injection water, your native groundwater, and then any interaction that might be occur. Especially if your injection water is oxygenated, you can create issues with clogging of pores with just maybe a benign cement like calcium carbonate, or you could possibly mineralize or mobilize minerals um, that would be deleterious. And then we also need to think about how groundwater flows and mixes. It's not always as predicted. Um, water temperature does matter, density matters, and our assumptions of homogeneity and isotropic conditions in aquifers really need to be verified before this can be applied widely. The, the water chemistry concern that is the most vexing and is close to home is um, one of arsenic mobilization. We, this already is an issue in large parts of Minnesota, mostly with um, glacial aquifers, but also some bedrock aquifers. And it's something um, that is, arsenic is kind of loosely bound in some cases and can be mobilized with oxidized water, but there's a, a complicated path of oxidation and dissolution and mobilization that has been studied quite a bit in um, soil, water, and climate by, um, I believe, let's see, got to dredge these names up, Sarah Nicholas, and then Mindy Erickson, who was in civil and environmental engineering, and then people who are at the health department now. So that would be one mineral of concern. Um, and then if we do need to minimize how much oxygen is in the water, well, there's a treatment for that. Engineers can design a system to degasify the water. And that has been done in other places where arsenic is an issue. So you, you create this um, chamber where the liquid comes in, you have a stripping gas that mixes with the, with the oxygenated water, and then you have a, a non-oxygenated water that's leaving the system. And in Bradenton, Florida, they did achieve a, a significant four log reduction of dissolved oxygen with such a chamber. The other consideration for engineering is this injection period versus the withdrawal period. You might know that in Minnesota, the water use in the summer goes up in sixfold in some of these suburban communities because of lawn irrigation. So we do have this highest need period if we continue to allow that to occur. We have this high need period in the summer and we would potentially want to inject in the season leading up to that and in the season after that. So the injection water needs to be available at those times of year. Um, in the case of the Buffalo Aquifer, where Moorhead is really two thirds of the population of the county and it's a drinking water source along with the Red River. The Red River is actually 80% of the drinking water now, but in drought years, they need to rely more on groundwater sources. So we were investigating this aquifer in particular to see if um, the drought tolerance and the increasing population could be offset with injection into the aquifer. This is a case where the time of year of water availability is important. What you might do is during flood years in the Red River, which usually is an early springtime, um, late winter phenomenon, you would inject flood water into the aquifer, the Buffalo aquifer, and then just store that for some period of time in the future when the river flow is lessened. The issue um, with pumping water from Moorhead into the Buffalo Aquifer and the river goes right through Fargo and Moorhead is the distance actually. I mean, you have to have significant piping. Now, um, we know this region's not afraid of large engineering projects, um, so that might be a possibility. But this aquifer also has an arsenic bearing sulfide minerals, so that's an additional concern. Um, they currently have fairly high arsenic levels. In Olmsted County, where Rochester is the dominating city, 
um, and we expect a large expansion of population there because of the Destination Medical Center. Um, they currently have a really unusual way of getting their water. They have 33 different wells that kind of are all around the city. So they don't have any centralized drinking water treatment. They are all drawing groundwater from the Jordan Aquifer and there is a projected increase in this aquifer use along with this expected decline. And what you see here in the gray in this map is area of water level decline um, for the city of Rochester metropolitan area. Kind of an old map, but. The problem with Olmstead County is there are no surface water features of significant size that could be used like the Red River in Moorhead. However, their centralized wastewater treatment plant could be serve as a source for this water if you can treat it to the standards required. Um, there are some other concerns with the groundwater in Olmstead County and one of those is high nitrates. Um, contamination from agriculture. So this could potentially be a way to um, uh, dilute the nitrate contamination if that becomes a problem in the metropolitan area. Um, the nitrate contamination comes from this being just a vulnerable area with thin surficial cover and very highly transmissive aquifers. And then the Straight River groundwater management area, if you recall, is the one that we didn't do a scenario for with the injection modeling. This is a surficial aquifer, um, uh, spans a lot of counties up in the Pineland Sands area. You can see it's at the junction of Harvard and Becker and w Wadena and Clearwater counties. We were mostly looking at the portion of the aquifer that's in Becker County because the Minnesota Geological Survey has recent at an atlas for that area. And if you can see the grayed out area on the air photo on the left, the aquifer in question, it's a superficial sand, it's agricultural, and you, I think you can make out the center pivot irrigation. It's pretty much covered with center pivot irrigation. So that is the um, risk of overuse. It's also the risk of degraded water quality. This is an area of um, potato farming primarily. So there's high nitrogen and um, the chemicals used for potatoes. And this groundwater recharges to the Strait River, which is a cold water ecosystem, it's a trout stream. So charge, if recharge to the stream is lessened, there's the threat of the water temperature actually going up in the stream, which would compromise that habitat. So this starts to become kind of a DNR issue when habitat is involved. The largest city, Park Rapids, has 4,000 people in it, and it's at the downstream end of this aquifer. So it's down here at the lower end. They don't have a centralized wastewater treatment plant that would generate the quantities required, and you would have to pipe it up to the headwaters of this watershed. So in this one, we had to conclude that currently there's no source of water for recharge of this quaternary water table aquifer. The best you could do is try to um, uh, do some more irrigation scheduling or, you know, somehow some managed recharge at the surface, passive recharge at the surface in wet years. But we can see that 84% of the, the use is irrigation. We don't know what the sustainable yields are for this aquifer currently. Um, and we know that the nitrates are high and getting higher in this aquifer. So they, they need something, um, but this is probably not the tool for them because of the lack of water sources. And then finally, Washington County, this shows the whole county, but we really did focus on that area around um, Woodbury, Jordan Aquifer, all the residents relying on groundwater, 80% of the population is on public water supply. And historically it was agricultural, but it is rapidly urbanizing. And the total demand is expected to increase even more by almost 30%. So they would have had a need um, just from use alone um, it is a confined aquifer. Um, the shallow water table is susceptible to contamination. 97% of the county is moderately to very high sensitivity to pollution. And that explains why the perfluorinated alkaline substances from th the 3M disposal sites at the surface have spread so widely across the county. Um, these sites were initially at Oakdale, Woodbury, Cottage Grove, and Lake Elmo, which is a pretty good scattering of buckshot, but it has spread significantly. So there has been conversation actually, even now before the project has ended, that ASR might be a way to create a clean groundwater bubble for cities like Woodbury that rely on groundwater. You could inject water around their current well field and have them recover that. But more recently, um, we 
our team members, Tony Runkle and Peter Kong, have been engaged with the committee that's looking at possible scenarios for plume um, remediation. And they're using, they're investigating ASR as a tool for um, the plume control itself. So not just creating water supply for Woodbury, but they will probably be looking at a few scenarios, but one of them has them pumping out water upstream of Lake Elmo here, if you can see my cursor. So on the west side of Lake Elmo, pumping out a lot of water and treating it. And it's more water than actually can be consumed at the surface. So one scenario would be to inject that water back into the ground um, downstream of Lake Elmo on the east side. And then that way you would also be kind of hurrying the contamination out of the ground that's in that West Lakeland Township area. So we were pleased um, to have anticipated this potential need for ASR. Um, and that's one of the things we're gonna be pointing out as we head to the Capitol. Um, this, this study was sponsored by legislators uh, two years ago, and we promised we would get them some recommendations back. And I think this is still a work in progress, even though we're talking with them as early as next week. But I think one of the things we'll say is, you know, there's no reason for Minnesota not to have primacy over these class five injection wells. I understand that the stormwater community actually already has, um, does seek permission from the EPA to do class five wells. I learned that at the Water Resources Conference um, not that long ago. And then we should probably start to establish some very clear standards for when ASR should be considered. It's certainly not the tool for everyone at every time, um, but maybe it becomes available after they've demonstrated conservation and reuse practices have been exhausted, or they've demonstrated that the economic and energy considerations are so strong that it makes, a, it makes more sense than in the other way to get water. Or maybe it's that their environmental benefits are needed, like to recharge a trout stream or a fen or to keep a lake at a certain level. So we need to establish those standards. Currently, there aren't any. And then ideally, we would make these aquifer test data available through a centralized database. The DNR is probably the most likely place for this to be housed. And I know that they are trying to get their aquifer data stored in a more accessible way. I don't think this is one of their considerations and, and we would like to make that a recommendation. And then the MDH has allowed this to happen in one-off scenarios. Um, the city of St. Michael has an aquifer storage and recovery project. And so they know what they required of that city. And if we could kind of codify that permitting path and establish that uh, process um, so that others could go about this in a little more um, easy way or anticipate actually what the the needs of the permits are going to be then it would make it would allow them to estimate um, what's involved and then once you do have a system up and running um, you should probably test it before full impl implementation and that was done with the one existing one and then regularly monitor it after it's employed so I'm practicing those recommendations on you. If you have other um, input or suggestions or concerns, please um, let's take the last 10 minutes for you to give the, those to us because um, that is part of this process. We want to engage all stakeholders and that counts as everybody here in the room. And then John's gonna keep you all updated on the um, Water Resources Center website and through that tab there, um, although he gives my contact information, but <laughs> we're going to uh, keep you all um, informed through these methods. Um, thanks. Great, thank you, Carrie and John as well. I'll open up the floor for questions. Feel free to unmute or also type in the chat. We'll keep an eye on that. I'll, I'll start that interesting presentation. I, one, one thing I um, was wondering with the increased precipitation that we have, and I assume that fills up our aquifers naturally. And so how do you take that into account when you're determining whether you're going to be over applying or uh, injecting too much water. 
And, and it, is that a concern with the increased precipitation that we are currently having right now? That's interesting. Yeah, good point. So if it does lead to direct aquifer recharge, like in this official aquifer, then you certainly would want to have a larger margin of safety if, if you can demonstrate that. I, I think that, you know, our, we'd have to really understand the intensity of those events and the seasonality of those events to actually say that they are recharging the aquifers. And we can also look at the age of the water in the bedrock confined scenarios and see that some of those are quite old. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, if you have perfluorinated alkaline substances in it, it's not old, but like Rochester, you, we can radiocarbon date water, we can do cesium dating, other methods. And if it's not being recharged within, um, you know, decades, then I think we're safe for now. Mm -hmm. But that's a good point. I'm going to start keeping notes of these. <clears throat> I, I guess... Yeah, and, and that too is uh, I think the seasonality and the timing of the year is is, is critical. It, it, no different than we have with uh, other flooding and, and water, stormwater management issues. Sure. And we're getting this increased precipitation. What we're seeing, especially in southeast Minnesota, uh, down that Rochester area, is these more severe events more often. But all that water coming at one time um, does not uh, um, allow for slow infiltration. Most of that water off the landscape. So we're getting more precipitation in some cases, but it's not infiltrating. Not, yeah, so that was another question I had was, uh, is this more appropriate for <clears throat> those types of landscapes or soils, ones that don't infiltrate quickly, like um, as opposed to maybe the sandy areas where you actually have use a lot of irrigation versus the other areas where you don't use as much or any irrigation? Um, yeah, it, it may be. I mean, I can tell you that during this project, a city did approach us and they were, um, they have a deep confined glacial aquifer, mm -hmm. four or four or five different confined sand bodies that are glacial, and then a bed, deeper bedrock aquifer and their glacial sand bodies had gone dry. And I think that's because they hadn't been recharged. They pumped them for about a decade and then it just ran out of water. So they felt like those were candidates for recharge. It would allow them to keep their existing treatment plants, their existing wells, and you know all their infrastructure, and then store water for another decade. So that's that's one scenario. You know, for the irrigation scenario, like Southern Dakota County, um, I it gets complicated in places like Dakota County because the irrigation wells are required to be in the bedrock aquifers, but the water table is in the superficial aquifer. So I think each case has to be considered separately for the geology first. Okay, Thank, thanks, very interesting seminar. Hi, I have a question, um, Fabian. Thanks for the seminar. I was just wondering if you have looked at, um, you know, a lot of places where there is um, groundwater for human consumption uh, from like, um, personal wells. Uh, there is also um, septic fields, and what is the role of that um, that system? You know, where the household is using water from from a you know well in that household, and obviously a lot of that water gets basically recirculated back to to the system, right through the uh, through the leach fields. Yeah, we did not look at that, but that would be an example of passive recharge, probably not of the same aquifer because that's kind of the point when you design those systems. And I've, I was on my planning committee for this, for my township and, you know, you want it down gradient of the well and you also are shallower. So usually those are shallow systems that recharge the superficial aquifer, I hope. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. It gets so quiet when Owen's mic is on. <laughs> it does. Are there any other questions? If you want to send any emails, please do. Um, the easier email address for me is carrie at umn.edu. And 
I really am starting legislative visits next week with the people that were um, on the author list just to explain this to them um, and present it to their water subcommittee already. So tips help. Oh, thanks. She pasted it in the chat. Perfect. Thanks, Gary. Well, thank you for inviting us. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank yes, you thank again. you both, Carrie and John, for being yep. here. And thanks for everybody, everybody's attention. Um, and again, we have uh, our last seminar will be next Wednesday, a week from today, same time, same Zoom channel. <laughs> so see you then. <laughs> Thanks for the claps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yes, thanks again to both okay. of you. Okay, bye-bye.